Uh, uh, we all hope that you are doing well, uh, staying safe and healthy. My name is Michelena, uh, for those of you that don't know. On behalf of the Ballad organizing team, we just wanna thank you for joining us today. The, we're gonna begin the presentation, uh, but first I'm gonna go over a few housekeeping items. So the presentation is scheduled for one hour-ish. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna stick close to the, uh, to the hour. Uh, and this will include the, the Q&A. But if you have additional questions after we've ended, please feel free to send us an email at valid at global-executive-learning.com. For this session, we're going to try to, we're, we're trying to replicate the, the feel of the global forum meeting. So once we begin, uh, Carl's gonna place everyone on mute, but if um, during this time you have questions or things that you want to ask for our, our presenter, Tomas, uh, or thoughts that you wanna share with the group, please use the chat feature at the um, chat box at the bottom of your, um, your Zoom box. And um, we'll monitor these and, and, and move these forward to, to Yuri. But um, Thomas is gonna speak for a bit and then Yuri's gonna open the format up for, um, for Q&A. And um, you are welcome to continue using the chat box to ask questions or you can unmute yourself um, and ask your question, but we just would ask that you remute yourself after you've asked your, your question. Um, the, the session is being recorded and uh, a link to the recording uh, and the slides will be sent in about a day or so. Um, but included in the link, uh, very important, we have a five minute survey. It's literally three questions and it will take less than five minutes. Um, if you just take a few minutes to complete the survey, um, this is helping to give us feedback uh, so that um, we can make these valid uh, um, engagements, um, you know, informative, thoughtful, um, the, the highest best use of your time. Is make sure to complete those. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Yuri. Uh, and thank you so much. Well, thank you, Michelina, and welcome everyone. It's good to see so many friends after so many years too, in case of Evan and Deborah, and Mary from Ireland, and Bill, Patricia, Paul, Paul Collett from the UK, and of course, Kershani from South Africa. Great to see you again. Well, we have about 50 people on the online now, or people have registered. So as is our tradition, I want to just ask maybe a few people who have not been with us at the Global Forum to say a few words just about themselves, or maybe I'll just mention where you're from and not embarrass you. Maybe next time you can prepare your full biography for a discussion. So I have Jeff from South Africa, Vimal from India, Susan from Bahrain, and then Kay, Sharon, David and Werner from the United States, and Nelson from Ecuador, and Nermin from Sweden. So a special welcome to all of you there. Our host for today is also uh, Oka Reinholdson, uh, Senior Executive and Trusted Advisor to Companies, and in the public sector, the former Head of HR for the City of Stockholm, and now GEL Senior Partner. So welcome to Oka as well. Uh, a special hello, maybe, or at least a hope for recovery is for Osa in Sweden, who is uh, now recovering from the coronavirus, as is her family. So we hope that that'll be a speedy a recovery for her. Of course, I'm delighted to have Thomas with us. You have the biography there in your invitation. He's the president and CEO of the leading construction and property development company in the Nordic region of Europe, uh, based in Stockholm. Uh, he will speak for about 15 minutes, which is unusual, maybe 20, because you know Thomas has a lot to say, and I've never heard him speak for only 20 minutes, but he is going to try and they will have 25 minutes or so for questions and discussions. Now, if you'd like to ask a question throughout the presentation, do so on your chat button, which is at the bottom of your screen. And we'll, of course, monitor that and ask uh, Thomas to answer any of these, or most of them if he can, uh, at the end. Or you can also raise your hand at the, after the presentation to indicate that you'd like to say something or discuss something with Thomas. So many of us have met Thomas, and if you have met Thomas at the Warsaw Global Forum in 2017, where he spoke at that time about his work as CEO of Sweco, when he was turning it around and making it into the leading architecture and engineering consultancy of Europe. As we are a community of practice, maybe I'll and know each other pretty well. I'll say a few more personal notes about Thomas, if he doesn't mind. He is a very thirsty learner, like all of us, <laughs> full of energy, incredible energy and someone who gives us time to share his experience and wisdom with others 
around the world. His passion is to help build things for people, fit for people, and fit for purpose, for a sustainable future. He also serves community and country. He is also presently a member of the Restart Commission, initiated by the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, where there are prominent members like him from academia and business, and their purpose is to propose measures to restart the Swedish economy and present the report uh, to the government in August. So it looks like it's going to be a very busy summer for you there too, uh, Tom. So Thomas, welcome and thank you for being with us today. It's all yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and um, uh, before I start uh, trying to, to master Zoom and sharing my presentation, I'd like to re-emphasize for what Yuri said. You know, the important thing here is the dialogue and the questions. I'm going to talk uh, a bit. I've been told in no uncertain terms that it's, it has to be within 15 minutes. So I'll try to stick to that. Uh, uh, and then we'll do questions. But let me just share my presentation first. Uh, that should be sort of it. Uh. So, um, uh, for my 15 minutes, I will talk around this presentation. I will talk a little bit about my current company, ANSYSE, uh, but I will also talk a little bit about my background and my, um, my experience with, with transitions and uh, crises. Uh, and then I will try to wrap it up with um, some thoughts on, on how to lead a company in a transition, but actually more general on how to, to lead a company. So first, something about um, uh, about the ANSYS. Uh, as you already said, we're uh, the leading construction and property development company in the Nordic region. Um, uh, and the easiest way to think about is that we build stuff. Everything that you can imagine, we build it. We also invest in uh, in commercial real estate. We are active throughout the value chain uh, in this. Uh, in this business, we have manufacturing of certain types of materials, uh, but our main um, uh, part in the value chain is project management and, and, uh, uh, and construction. We have a turnover in 2019 of 58 billion Swedish kroners. And for those of you who doesn't trade in Swedish kroner on a regular basis, the easiest way to convert it into dollars is divide with 10. That gives you a fair approximation of, uh, of the value. So uh, roughly uh, just short of, of $6 billion. We have 15,500 employees, most of them white collar project management staff. Uh, that's not normally how you think about a construction company. We have a couple of thousand construction workers, but we also have on a daily basis around 35,000 subcontractors on our project, uh, um, which means that the leadership challenge for this group is uh, leading an organization of around uh, 50,000 people. So that's the company in one way. Another way to think about it is that we have, uh, the organization has uh, five business areas, and that's what you would see in, in our annual report or a quarterly report, operating within um, three pretty distinct different uh, bis uh, uh, business models. Uh, the first one is industry, and that's where we have uh, collected all of our assets, uh, all of our fixed assets. That's um, Quarries uh, spread all, all, all over the Nordic countries. It's asphalt production. We are one of the uh, largest asphalt producers in Europe. Um, it's also our foundation business. And then there's some other smaller businesses where we have fixed assets uh, and leading that with the business logic of the business with the lots of, lots of fixed assets. And then we have the large construction part, three business areas divided. Um, basically based on, on, on geography and type of delivery. So we have two business areas called building. That's buildings of all types. It's 
residential buildings, its airports, its offices, its schools, uh, its hospitals. And if I should mention something in particular, particular, we are uh, the largest hospital builder in the Nordic region. Right now, we have 12 different uh, hospital construction sites ongoing. Um, and then we have one business area dealing with infrastructure, and that's actually more than infrastructure, it's civil engineering in general, it's roads, railways, um, bridges, uh, hydropower, anything that you normally associate with uh, heavy civil engineering construction. And then finally, we have our own property development launch, where we invest our own money based on the idea that with our organization, we have a good knowledge uh, of, of where the construction industry is moving in our geographies. And then we try to invest at early stages in emerging, of, uh, emerging um, parts of uh, metropolitan cities in, in the Nordic region. So that's, that's NCC, the shortest version that I can do. Feel free to ask lots of questions about this. I can entertain you less the rest of the night. About me, uh, I'm, I'm approaching 30 years in this industry, but I'm limiting this to my uh, educational background and what I've done for the last 10 plus years or so. Uh, originally, I'm, uh, I'm a civil engineer. I have a master's degree in civil engineering from Chalmers University uh, of Technology in, <clears throat> in, in Gothenburg. Uh, and then later on, uh, I spent two years studying for actually two MBAs, but it's, it's you know, in the interest of full transparency, it's one. Uh, it's a, co a collaboration between London Business School and uh, Columbia Business School MBA. Uh, I did two uh, majors actually on that. One was for Columbia Business School on financial engineering, that is the studies of the really large Excel spreadsheets, and then change management for London Business School. And if I would like to say something about, you know, uh, going back to school and doing, and I was around 40 when I did this, so just short of 40. It was much more valuable than I ever thought that it could be, because with some 15 years of, of uh, of professional experience going back and actually spending time thinking about what business meant uh, was super valuable for me. And I, I always say that I couldn't have the job that I've had uh, you know, now in the last 10 years without uh, going back to school. Uh, and then you know, professionally over the last 10 years, I was heading up NCC, the company where I'm working now. Um, at that time, we had another type of organization uh, organized around geographies. So that was Sweden alone, uh, head of construction Sweden. That was roughly half of the, of the business uh, for many years. Uh, and in, then in 2012, I left uh, to become the CEO of Sveco. And Juri mentioned it. It's an architectural uh, and engineering design company. Uh, and when I when I joined uh, Sveco in 2012, it was a company with uh, 7,000 engineers and architects. I had a good position in Sweden, some business in Finland and Norway. And when I left uh, five years later, uh, we were the European leader. We had more than doubled our turnover. We had more than doubled our uh, employees. We had more than tripled our market cap. So I, I will in include my experience from that, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of leading in transition. And then I came back to NCC in 2018. Uh, and you might wonder why I did that. That was not really the plan. The plan was to develop into something else or stay with, with, with Steco. I had a fantastic job. We were moving in the right direction. But then again, we had started to come into somewhat somewhat of a maintenance phase. We had the strategy uh, uh, done, we had the team done, uh, so I was trying to look for something else and then NCC had run into some pretty serious problems. So I was approached by, uh, by the chairman at that time uh, and uh, in the beginning I was uh, 
really reluctant to say the least uh, on, on coming back. But in the end, I said, you know, maybe I can do something. And it was a, it was a mix of, you know, I owe, owe the company something because uh, it has given me so much in professional development up until 2012. But also, I think I can do something with this. I, I, I think I know where we have the challenges and what we can do. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how do we think about that. Um, and then, you know, trying to establish some credentials on leading under pressure uh, and in transformations. These are the, the major events that I've had uh, during my career as a, uh, as a senior, senior manager. Uh, you know, before that I had other types of crises, but this is uh, crisis is that impacted the entire organization in a major way, starting with the millennium crisis in 2001. And uh, I mean, that was obviously a global crisis, but we also had a homemade Swedish crisis in the real estate industry at the same time. So that was kind of major. And then a couple of years later, we, there was a, a, an asphalt cartel uncovered in the Nordics. Uh, we were part of NCC was particip participating and I was tasked with trying to clean this and I spent a disproportionate uh, part of my life trying to clean up after a major, major, major disaster in the asphalt cartels. I know more about anti-competition law that I'm, than anyone should ever need to know. Um, and then after that, I, um, and this was during my time as heading uh, Construction Sweden, we had the financial crisis in 2008, 2009. Um, from the perspective of, you know, with the, with the advantage of hindsight, that seems to be a really quick crisis. But we didn't know that at that time that we would have this V-shaped uh, rebound and the economy would come back again in 2010. I vividly recall quarter one 2009 we had order intake down 65 percent and we didn't know uh, when it would stop uh, we had around 10,000 employees in construction sweden at that time we made contingency plans for laying off 1,000 people we made another set of contingency plans for laying off 2,000 people we met, made one with 3,000 people, and then after that, we said, then it's, it's Armageddon. We can't do anything uh, after that. We came to execute on the, on the laying off uh, 2,000 people uh, during 2009, um, and, and that made me think a lot about how do you lead in times like that, challenges, and what's important, and as the ultimate leader in or, of an organization, what do you do? Then the economy came back. I left NCC and started at Sveco. And the growth that we achieved during my tenure was, uh, it was 5% organic growth, and then it was 10% um, acquired growth. We did a, a, a string of acquisitions. Uh, one large in, in Sweden, where we acquired a railway consultancy from, from the Swedish state, but the big and really transformative uh, acquisition was when we bought uh, our Dutch competitor Hontmai from, uh, from, from the Amsterdam Stock Exchange uh, in a year-long process and integrated that and that's actually the foundation for where Sweco is today. And then I Thomas, came back just to give you a, tell us a little time check we're into 12 minutes now. I'll, okay I'm gonna need the 20 probably. And then we have the, uh, the turnaround for, for NCC. So after this, and then we have the corona crisis now in the middle of, of this. So uh, based on this experience, I've come up with, with a number of rules on how to think about it. And this is one of the rules that I have. Uh, as you enter into a transformation or a crisis, there are three steps that you need to go through. Uh, one, the first one is to ensure stability and clarity in the organization, stop the free fall, make sure that, you know, uh, people understand why we are doing things and, and, and how it's going to happen. And then continue by improving profitability from where you are. And then as a third step, 
uh, drive growth. Uh, and just to give you a hint for the NCC group, we're now at step number two. Um, and I also ca came come up with four things that I try to spend my days on. These are the four things that I, I, I if, if I'm, I'm really successful, I spend my time only on these four things. A disproportional of time on getting the team right, uh, thinking about do I have the right people for this situation? Do they have uh, a good mix or based on, on uh, experience, education, capabilities, etc., you know, backgrounds, everything. So do I have the right team? I spend my time on governance, the formal governance systems. Uh, this is not something that comes natural to me. I think it's pretty boring, actually. But I've come to learn that governance is one of the most powerful tools that you can have. The bureaucracy of a company is one of the most powerful tools you can have uh, in an organization to, to drive a, a transformation. You, they tend to have a, a pretty fixed uh, pace. But one of my learned things is that you can change that pace. You can have it more or less frequent. You can add, uh, add parts of the governance systems as you need uh, to drive the transformation. And then it's right allocation of capital. Uh, and you know, as the CEO, I'm pretty much in charge of a uh, allocation of capital. If you're in a, an, a you know, uh, not the ultimate decision maker, I think it's important that you think about what kind of, of suggestions do you take to management for allocation of capital? Is this worthwhile? And is it al aligned with what the company is trying to do? And then, you know, fourth but not uh, least at all, communication in all types of forums. Um, and it's mostly for internal use. Uh, when I do press, uh, it's not for the stock market, it's for, uh, for our own organization. Small group meetings, large group meetings, and I think communication skills is one of the most underrated skills that you need to have uh, as a leader of an organization. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to keep to my, my time, Yuri. Don't worry. Uh, the one thing, and if you if you think about what what people say about leaders in in transformations and and crisis is, is that, that you try to picture yourself as involved in everything that's happening. And I think that's a, a false notion. As the ultimate leader, you need to be, your responsibility is to make sure that you keep your, uh, your perspective. You've spent time before making sure that you have the team. They should take care of, of, of the organization. So um, if I give an example for, um, from, the, from the ongoing uh, corona pandemic, uh, I've spent roughly 30 minutes a day dealing with corona uh, on a daily update. You know, we've adjusted the governance system, so I have a, a daily briefing on corona, and then I have a team dealing with the crisis management of that. And I spend my time thinking about the future, where will we go? Uh, you mentioned the, the Restart Commission. Uh, I'm involved in a number of other uh, initiatives like that. Uh, but also for the group, making sure that we understand that we should have business continuity processes. So uh, to wrap up and to uh, open up for questions, um, three things uh, uh, that I think is important to remember, and that is consistent leadership. Regardless if you're in a transition or if you're leading your team at any time, consistent leadership. Don't try to change your leadership just because you're in a transition or you, because it's a, um, uh, it's a crisis. The same rules apply. Uh, stay updated. Uh, having a consistent leadership and not uh, making sure that you have your team doing what they uh, are supposed to do doesn't mean that you detach yourself from the organization, but you need to stay updated. And then for example, the half an hour updates that I've had on the corona uh, situation on a daily basis for several months now. And then make sure that you keep your perspective. And that's my short start on a huge topic. Um, but, you know, we have, we have to stick to the rules. So this I'm looking forward to the questions. Incredible, Thomas. Thank you so much. Under 20 minutes even. This is historic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Well, of course, there are many people in the, on the call who have their own transformations that they're going through. I'm thinking of Kershna U and Medbank in South Africa, uh, Sharon from UPS. And uh, I think we'll start therefore by providing you as much time as possible. But first we'll have two or three questions. One from Oka, who is thinking about the future and buildings and the offices of the future. Mm -hmm. I'll ask something too. And then we'll ask uh, Pierre-Henri to Pardon Postal, who's going through major transformation in the railway industry and sector. And then we throw it open to everybody else who would like to ask questions. We've and, promised and possible to do that. And Michelena, go ahead. Uh, and yes, I was just going to say, we also have some uh, questions coming in from the chat. And the chat, of course, mm -hmm. that you can see at the bottom there. And you could also raise your hand if you'd like to do that after the first couple of questions. So, Oka, please, your first question. Thank you. Hello, Thomas. I Hello. have a question about the future, as you indicated, and that is, uh, have you already put people on uh, thinking uh, path uh, regarding the future buildings like hospitals, as you mentioned, will, will CJ people have a home office in the future when the new pandemic uh, are turning up and so on and so forth? What, what's, what's happening in your line of business, so to speak, if you think about uh, a few years ahead? Now, uh, you know, to, to answer the first part of the question, no, we haven't really started to think about uh, the future, not, the, not because people don't want to, but we've actually actively stopped that. Going back to my first in the slide with the three phases, we're still in the, in, in the make sure that we have stability, that we have clarity. On. Right now, it's really unclear on you know, what will happen. And what has been really clear over the you know, last one and a half, two months, is that you can, you, uh, I'm presented with scenarios uh, going in basically every direction. You know, there's a very popular scenario that uh, we will not work from offices at all going forward. Um, that, that's a, a really popular uh, scenario, but there's also an, an, a, a scenario saying that this has demonstrated that the social interaction to get um, innovation and, and a social context for an organization proves to be even more important than we thought before. So we don't know where that's going, but we're, we're monitoring it uh, very clearly. Mm. Uh, we have, uh, we, we have a, uh, you know, we think that there will be a, a profound change in the areas that you, you mentioned in, in offices. We think there will be a profound change. Society and that's for different types of uh, of external shocks, um, but we haven't started coming up with a firm idea on on where it's going. We have scenarios that is covering basically three cyclic things. Thank you very much. Yeah. I see there are several chat questions relating to your your personal perspectives and how you find the right people and so on. But let me start by just asking you one question, which I've asked you before many times, yeah. but. You know my you know my way of doing it, and I would like to ask you, what transformations have you gone through personally in all of these turnarounds and transformations? I know you said you have to keep your consistent leadership, but I've seen the change in you over the years too, and so therefore this the kind of principle of of uh, required mandate essentially. Why should people follow you if they don't see that you also change? So have you changed? Yeah, yeah I think I have changed. Um, you know. I, I think there's, uh, I have this personal idea that there's an important transition as a leader somewhere when you're leading an organization with four or 500 uh, people or so. Uh, when you start being more of an ambassador and a, and a politician, more than an, uh, an operator. You know, I used to be a, as hard as it might be to believe, but I used to be a, 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 a pretty aggressive project manager, uh, once labeled the only aggressive Swede in the world. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, you know, more, I, I would say I'm a more pleasant personality today, and I don't deal with details as much as I, I used to do. Uh, and I know that, you know, things happen, you know, choose your battles, 
pick your the fields where you are actually where you are, can actually make a difference uh, and develop and this is something i said to my to my last then my former uh, chairman i said you know um, you're an investment guy you you work with with investments and he said yeah, yeah i work with investment you have a, a an organization with 15 people but what happens when you run a large organization is that you develop a, a, a an ability to actually not see things that should be changed in the organization because the organization can only handle maybe three or four or possibly five things, major changes at any given time. And then you have to ignore all the other 100 things that you know could be done better. Uh, so you try to keep the perspective, uh, see the long-term future battles. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question here, similar in a way, but uh, Charles Broussard is asking, what practices do you have to keep your perspective, that is, to keep fresh? I, I find it genuinely hard, uh, <laughs> just to be, to be super transparent. I try to go to uh, a number of international uh, meetings annually, two or three annually to get uh, you know, uh, what's happening in the world. I read a lot. Uh, and I, I actually think it's important not only to read professional literature. I read, read a lot of, uh, lot of, of what's the English word? Uh, you know, novels and, and you know, fiction. fiction. You know, I, great, great writers. Uh, that has nothing to do with business. Uh, to, to get the perspective on life. Um, and then I read, uh, you know, lots of professional material as well. Uh, and, Try to challenge myself as, as frequently as I can, and then I have a habit since maybe 20 years. I try to set aside one day a month uh, where I, you know, nothing booked, no meetings. I leave the office. I, you know, spend that day, you know, all alone, uh, and try to think. Most days I fail miserably, but some day, some days I come up with something that turns out to be important. Now, you once told me that part of what you, you lead with is telling stories. Absolutely. So you, took special, you took special classes and so on. And how has that helped you in your leadership too? Well, it has. And, it, and it's part of where, why I think communication is important. Because, you know, as, uh, if, if, the way I think about, about leadership is making a group of people do something they wouldn't have done without your, you being there. And, and as, the, uh, as, as the group becomes larger and larger, it's all about telling a compelling story. And it's actually not only about the story, it's how, you, how you're performing. So, perform it. so I, I actually took acting classes. I'm thinking about going back. I, I, as I get older, my voice get, gets weaker. I need to train my voice. <laughs> That's good. I, I see that also Pierre Henri from uh, Foslo will be promised would uh, be able to ask a question. Would you like to ask your question or would you like to read it? Would you I like can, you to read it? Uh, I can say it uh, if, you, if you want. Now, yeah. My question is you are in a transformation since maybe two years or something like that. Yes. You are experiencing many tough situations with the COVID and stuff. How do you keep your workforce, how you, do you keep your team? The spirit up in those times because uh, if they do not believe anymore they will lose any any hope they will lose their momentum and their their, their will how do you keep their their spirit up mm. uh, first of all i take the team uh, over you know if, if you look at the team that i have today uh, the management team uh, thirds are new since i started so i i, I spent the first 10 months uh, rearranging the organization. I, I took, uh, took out the organization and levels. I, re, uh, I appointed new managers for, for, uh, for the group. Not all, but two thirds are new. Uh, so I spent a lot of time dealing with that. And then we actually went even further. So of the top 150 people in the organization, uh, compared to two years ago, half have new jobs. It doesn't mean that we have, um, you know, replaced uh, half, but we have promoted some that that, that that I felt needed a new challenge. We have 
uh, reshuffled the organization. We have um, made uh, roughly 30 people leave. We've recruited roughly 30 people from the, least, uh, from the outside of the world. So that's the first thing. It's my team. That, that's the first thing. And then it's all, all about communication. You know, making sure that we have a common view on what can be done, um, how long can it take, what are the challenges, um, keeping in touch with, with, uh, with, with all the people. And I talk to, to my, my immediate team, my, my closest 10 people, a lot. And, you know, they are pretty senior people. They run huge business areas or huge staff. So formally, I probably wouldn't have to talk to them every week, but I make sure that I have a pretty long conversation with all of them, just checking in. How do you feel about this? What's your challenges? Uh, you know, what went well this week? You know, can we celebrate anything together? Uh, can we help you somehow? Uh, keeping in touch, communicating. Great, very good, thank you. I see that uh, Vima from India has a question there too. Vima, would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Hi, Yuri. Uh, well, I just Hello. made my question also in the, in the text. Thank you very much for having me on this call. My question was more related to one of the points that you mentioned about right team. Now, uh, of the four aspects of what you do in terms of crisis. Now, regarding the right team, is it that you put together the right team? Because isn't that going to be too late when you're in the middle of a crisis like this one to put a right team? Or is it that you have built the right team over a period of time and now it's about the right motivation for the team. Yeah, I, 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 yeah it's, it's a really important question. First of all, I have to say, uh, thank you for calling in from India. It's one of my favorite countries. I lived there two years in the 1990s. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, to, to put together a crisis team when the crisis is happening is, is actually too late. But what you have to do is to put together a team with that understand uh, um, the infrastructure of running a company. And one of the, the things that you need to do is to make sure that you work with the crisis management team. And, and you know, I started in, in, um, in, in May 2018. I spent half a year assessing the company, putting together my team. And, and then we actually spent a lot of time um, putting together a crisis management team during 2019, and I have to admit that we were a little bit lucky because we finalized the, the design of the crisis management team in December 2019, and, and they were planning to do a, a, a big practice exercise in May, like now, um, but as it happens, they started out playing uh, Champions League immediately, and they've done it you know, in a very, very good way. And, and that team you have in the crisis management team, I have our security manager, who's an ex-military guy. I have our communications manager. I have HR. I have um, uh, IT, of course, and lots of other experts. But it's headed up by one of my um, one of the people that I think is a potential successor to me. So this is sort of she is running this because I think she's a really talented leader and it's a way to test her as well. Yeah. Kershity from South Africa. It looks like it's a related question of maybe you need someone additional to your team too. Kershity, would you like to explain what you're asking here? Thank you, Yuri. I think uh, more and more we, we're hearing this concept of the chief empathy officer and the fact that the chief executive himself now needs to start driving this. So I just wanted to get a perspective of, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, on, on what that's landing like on your side. Yeah, and this is, I guess, that's because you're going through your own transformation there in South Africa. Yes, the bank, yes. so. And okay. sorry, you know, maybe just to also explain, so on the transformation piece um, in South Africa, what we are trying to do from a strategy perspective is take a strategy pivot approach, which has three components. So we're looking at resilience, which is to say, how do we keep the lights on? Mm -hmm. Then we're looking at transition, which is to say, so as we starting to move out of the crisis, what do we do? And then as we move out of the lockdown, and then thirdly, we're looking at reimagine. 
but it's not a sequential process. We're trying to do it in parallel. So it's also a bit of a challenge trying to keep the lights on and try to reimagine the future at the same time. So yeah. it'll all be good to get your perspective on, on that. Thanks. That, that I mean, that's striking, strikingly similar to, to my, you know, idea of, of stabilize, uh, improve profitability and then grow. Uh, that is, you can adapt it any process. It, it's something that, you know, if you look at stabilization of NCC today, it's something that we did a lot of work on that in 18 and beginning of 19, but still ongoing, improving profitability. Uh, that's something we started in, in 19. We will continue with that for many years. and. We've started some initiatives to find the, how do we grow the company going forward, and that can take a long time. So, absolutely clear. And I'm not sure that I understand the idea of, of a chief empathy officer. To me, empathy is, is actually one of the cornerstones of, of, of being a leader. I actually call it you have to be, have tough empathy. Being empathic is not enough. You have to be. You have to ask for results as well, but but uh, that's one of the cornerstones of leadership for me. You have to, and, and the way I put it normally when I talk to to the organization about leadership, and I said, you know, you have to just demonstrate tough empathy. You have to be, you have to demand results, but also deep down in your heart of heart, you need to have a strong desire that the team should be successful, not for your sake, but for their sake. You know, you 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 need to be want the, want the team to succeed be, because of them, not be, not to shine glory on me. Thank you. Yeah, and we have a question here from Nelson from Ecuador. Basically, Nelson, would you like to explain your question because I think it's now taking us in a slightly different direction. Uh, if you'd like, I can read it out to people. Which is the worst mistake that the government's made during the COVID-19 crisis? <laughs> oh, there we go, a little. Should, should I, uh, no, I, I have extensive media training and every time I get some question about, you know, um, giving grades to government, I pass that. Um, but if, if something I would say, it's, it's, if there's something that actually, if I leave my media training and say, <laughs> I think there's been a lot of political posturing, uh, trying to demonstrate that you're strong for your own sake and not trying to understand what kind of, of effect will this have. You know, closing down borders, for example, that has had enormous impact on, on economy and not necessarily doing that much uh, with, for, for um, preventing the spread of, of the virus, uh, uh, for example. But... You know, the, the, the political posturing is probably what I would have on top of my list. Okay, so related question takes you to you now from Bernhard Hauser. Bernhard, would you like, from uh, Germany, would you like to say, ask your question? Oh, yes, my, my question is, uh, Thomas, and thank you for your speech. Uh, um, what was the worst moment for you in this, in this crisis? And which of your talents, and maybe a hidden talent, every day normally but what helped you most in your own uh, way of doing things <laughs> well it, 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 I've had many bad moments throughout my career but the corona crisis have not really had that I, I think it has been uh, I, I, I said that at some point I think uh, this is where all my experience comes together. So I think it's been a, a, a pretty straightforward process from my point of view. Uh, but if I go back to previous crises or, or you know, things that I've tried to achieve, there are moments where you think that this is not going to happen. We are not going to survive this. When, you, when we made the plan to lay off 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 and what happens, it becomes even worse. You know, this is going to... Uh, we're going to destroy something uh, on my watch. That that's that's the worst moments. I, I think you know we 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 can't even continue to do the right things to protect the business because we don't understand what will happen. And that has happened frequently. Um, my hidden talent that I actually use as a, a form of yoga is that I cook. My 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 mother used to be a cooking teacher. So I, I, I've been cooking since I was a small boy and I do it as a form of, 
of yoga because you can't think of anything else if you try to do some decently complicated cook, uh, cooking. Oh. Uh, at least you would cut your your, your fingers. So so <laughs> I, I actually try to cook as frequently as I can. Oh, now I know why you love going to wonderful restaurants. Okay, absolutely, it's it's connect it's connected. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that question too. Um, I have someone from another country called Texas, George Consola. Do you have a question there, please? Uh, well, yes. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, you mentioned in your priorities, um, one of them was capital allocation. Yes. Uh, how has your capital allocation process or actual uh, decisions changed uh, during this COVID crisis? Um, the, the easiest way to think about it that I'm more risk averse. Um, we've actually postponed the number of, of investments, uh, you know, f for an indefinite time. Um, and, and now we think, and, and for two reasons. One is that we don't know what will happen with the uh, real estate business going forward or the business in general, going back to AUKUS question. So, so let's make sure that we retain as much capital as, as possible. That, but then we also think that there will be opportunities um, going forward. Uh, my assessment is that there will be uh, opportunities to invest in other things with Thank you very much. And now I have a question from Mexico. That, that, but by the way, that's a bet. Uh, I, it, that, there's nothing with certainty on that. That's a bet. I think that there will be opportunities uh, come forward. George, did you have a follow-up to that before I ask Jorge to ask his question? Uh, no, thank you. That was that was good. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you very much. Okay, you have a question here that you like to ask. Uh, yes, thank you. Hello to everyone. Um, uh, Thomas, one of the things during the time of crisis, um, it's uh, for the people in the organization to see that the leader shares the risk. Yes. And uh, I'm just curious of how, how do you do that? And, and you mentioned that you've been focusing your time on the long term and so forth. So how do you share that uh, risk and show it to, the, to your organization? Now, I, I think that's a great question. I think that's the one of the big, uh, big challenges here in, in, in this isolation because it's, it's, we're a construction company. And, and, and by the way, we, we've managed to maintain almost full production throughout the crisis so far. So our sites are going and we're producing and we have challenges on all the sites, but we find workarounds on that. At the same time, we've said that um, white collar staff that can work from home should be working from home. So our offices, we have 100 offices and they are more or less empty. Uh, so how do I do to, uh, to make sure that I, I, I share the risk? And one of the things that I've done is that I've actually been at the office with my closest team throughout the, uh, the crisis uh, and, and demonstrating that I understand that we have thousands and thousands and thousands of people that are out there um, uh, working. Um, uh, normally, I try to visit at least one project a week. Um, we have 3,000 projects ongoing uh, at, you know, on an av uh, average day. And normally, I, I try to visit one and, and try to do that as a, with um, all types of projects and in all geographies. And, and you know, that has been more problematic now because you can't travel, you know, flights are out and, and can't cross borders, but I still, uh, I, I have tried to, to visit some that has been within reach from Stockholm. Uh, I've set up um, uh, teams, uh, we use teams, digital meetings, uh, video meetings like this with the projects trying to discuss what's happening. But I think that's really challenging because I want to be there. You know, I worked in, in Kashmir in India and did night shifts in, in the mountains. You know, it has to be there. I worked in Russia, and you know, during the the Russia crisis, and I I made a point of being there, and that's really hard now. Um, so I do my best, but it's what you can do right now. 
Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And I see that there's several other requests, but uh, Chantal wrote me the longest question. So maybe I'll ask you to summarize that, Chantal. Please go ahead. <laughs> this will be our last question, unfortunately. Please go ahead. Chantal? Maybe it's not me. Maybe it's Gerhard Meyer. Gerhard, is it you? Oh, we have several aliases. Okay. Yes, so okay. maybe you can, because probably it's, yes, it's uh, probably it's uh, Gerhard Meyer, if not me. So, You're hurt? Oh, so please, do, you, do you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we do, Chantal. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question to Thomas. Uh, I think he knows our new CEO, uh, Ola Kalenius, who is in charge since May 2019. And I think he overtook in a very difficult situation uh, because first he had to reorganize uh, mobility at uh, a company like Daimler with some 280,000 mm -hmm. employees. And now he or the company is hit by the corona pandemic. And I carefully followed your, your presentation and he is now in your first step. That means in the priority steps, ensure stability and clarity in your organization. Yeah. And he already announced he wants to improve uh, profitability, but mm. we are far from that at the moment. So what would, and maybe you know him personally, he's appropriately your age. Uh, so what would you advise him to do? Oh, I, that's really hard. But, but you know, uh, to make sure that everyone, everybody understands what's, what's being done. And, and uh, you know, we've been kind of fortunate because we've been, we've had the ability to continue what we're doing. I've been not in, 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 in close contact with Ola at, at, at Daimler, but I've been had a close uh, contact with Volvo, uh, both cars and Amtrak's um, during this crisis. And they've, they've had similar challenges as, 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 as Daimler. Uh, and, I, and you're closing down factories and things like that. And I think the most important thing is that people understand that there's method to what you do. And, and what you do is, is to make sure that there will be a future going forward. Um, I, I think that, that's really similar to what we had on, uh, in, in, um, in the 2008 and 9 financial crisis when the order intake almost disappeared. Um, you know, make sure that everybody understands that even if you lay off people, even if you cl close down factories, it's for the good of everybody else. Uh, communication in that, and then I, 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 my, my guess would be that you in the organization actually know what you can do to improve profitability short term. Uh, and my, my inclination would be to say that trust the organization; they know what to do uh, short term. Thank you, Gerd. I'm sure you'll pass that on, and it could be an interesting conversation between. Yeah, I don't know him, by the way. I would love to know him. There you go. Gerhard, make it so number one, if you can, yeah. please. Now, that was our last question, unfortunately. And before I uh, pass it on to Michelena to say a few words about what's coming up, I'd like to thank Thomas for a wonderful discussion. Amazing within time, too. Thank you again, and very insightful, as usual. And I'd also like to thank Maria, part of your team, who helped us enormously, too, in the preparation, to the organizing team of the Global Forum, Chantal, to Carl, uh, to Oka and of course Michelena, who's also coordinating uh, this whole series of virtual meetings and discussions. So thank you again, Thomas. Thank you, everyone. And Michelena, thank it's all yours for a Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Michelena, would you like to lead us on there, please? Unmute myself, which I have to remember to do. And uh, let's see. Okay, there we go. All right. Um, so um, as Yuri said, on behalf of the, um, the, the, the Valid team, thank you so much. It's been wonderful um, having you all join us today. Um, I just want to call your attention to our upcoming uh, Valid presentations. And uh, so stay tuned, and we will be sending out uh, messages on this shortly. So you'll see on June 9th, we have Bonnie joining us, who's gonna talk about leading with vision and hope. On Thursday, June 18th, we'll have Marilee Adams with Steve Miranda and Nick Andrews, who will talk about changing your questions, changing our future. How the right kinds of questions are our best hope for leading, learning, and transformation. 
Uh, then, so as you can see, June will be a busy, busy month uh, for ballot presentations. Uh, at later that month, uh, we will have um, uh, Stefan Bauer and Hans Schlesinger, and apologies, Hans, for butchering your name, um, but they will uh, talk about transformation at Eli Lilly, a search for purpose and the transformation of self organizations and society. And uh, finally, uh, what we have coming up in July, for now, uh, maybe more, but um, we have Dan Nuremberg, um, who is gonna talk with us on Thursday, July 16th, uh, executive ownership creating highly effective leadership teams. Um, as I shared earlier, uh, we are recording, we have been recording this, um, this presentation. Um, and Thomas, thank you again. Uh, this was wonderful, and thank you so much for sharing. Um, uh, we will send the link out, which should happen in the next couple of days or so, but also included in that webinar link with the recording, again, uh, we have a very brief survey. It's three questions. Just take a few minutes and uh, give us feedback both on format and uh, things that you would like to see. That would be extraordinarily helpful for us as we look to plan out more of these gatherings uh, uh, as a bridge to our global forum in Massachusetts in 2021. So, um, Yuri, anything else? Or are we all? Now, you mentioned the word gathering. It reminded me of Michelle Obama's statement of the power of gathering. So, perfect. Yeah. Thank you again. Thanks again, Thomas. Very Thanks good. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank Wonderful you, everyone. Wonderful seeing everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 See you, Paul. Take Bye. care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Very good. Bye-bye now. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.